O God, our refuge and strength, who art the author of all godliness, be ready, we beseech thee, to hear the devout prayers of thy church, and grant that those things which we ask faithfully we may obtain effectually. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Verse 2 of him, 338. See now, thy children, making intercession through him, our Savior, Son of God incarnate, for all thy people living and departed, pleading before thee. We will now turn our attention to the canons of the Second Council of Orange, A.D. 529, text with a Introduction Translation by the Reverend F. H. Woods, B.D., Fellow of St. John's College. Uh, this was done in 18, looks like 82. Preface, this little work is primarily intended as an assistant to those students who are reading the subject of grace for their examination in the theological school at Oxford. But it is thought may be also useful for candidates for holy orders and others who are desirous of mastering the opinions of the church on this important subject. In preparing this work, I have to acknowledge my obligations to Dr. Bright's anti-Pelagian treatises introduction to which furnished me with one of two valuable hints, but in the main I've derived my information from an independent study of St. Augustine's works. I derived very much assistance in doing so from the excellent arrangement and invaluable index of the Benedictine edition of the Father. My reading, if it does done nothing else, has at least convinced me that no adequate knowledge of St. Augustine's opinions can be ex obtained except by a study of the writer's actual works firsthand. And it is hoped that this little book may lead to others to gain for themselves by su such subject a more complete and clear view than can be got by only reading the quotations of the Father which are here made. And any other works which I've consulted will be referred to in the footnotes. The quotations from St. Augustine and Prosper are from the Benedictine edition, St. John's College, Whit, Tuesday, 1882. Introduction. The Second Council of Orange has one peculiar feature, that it passed no original canons of its own. The object with which the Council met, as the preface states, was to examine and ratify certain articles or capitula sent by Felix IV, Bishop of Rome. This object is literally fulfilled, adding probably nothing whatever except the preface or preamble just alluded to and to a concluding paragraph explaining why it was certain why it was that certain of the illustrious laity had been invited to sign, as well as 13 bishops. This was also an unusual step, though not without precedent in the history of church councils. These articles, with the exception of Article 10, were borrowed almost verbatim from two writers, Prosper, probably a layman of Aquitaine, and Gennadius, a presbyter of Marseille. For an account of these, the former of these, and the part played as an opponent of Pelagian opinion, the reader should by all means consult the introduction of Bright's, give me a second, Bright's anti-Pelagian treatises. Of Gennadius, nothing is known except that we may gather from the two works that he has left us, De Scriptoribus Ecclesiasticus 
is merely an imitation and continuation of the similar work of St. Jerome. The second, Liber de Ecclesiasticus Dogmatibus, probably written 492 to 494, is that from which the quotations in these articles is made. It is a kind of summary of the writer's own faith on opinions and matters of doctrine and religious questions. Thus, he candidly confessed that he did not believe that the present world would be hereafter literally destroyed by fire, but only renovated. On the subject of Holy Communion, he recommended in most cases a weekly but spoke doubtfully of the value of a daily reception. On the doctrine of grace, with which we are chiefly concerned, we find the same outspoken candor. While he strongly insisted on the necessity of preventing, that would be preceding grace, he condemns in the most unqualified terms the doctrine of a predestined re reprobation see last paragraph but one of the acts of the council and in doing so he tacitly no well, not tacitly he tacitly condemns saint augustine himself partly on this account and partly on account of his depreciation of saint augustine and prosper and his approbation of faustus in de viris viris illustribus he is sometimes charged with being a semi-Pelagian, but such a charge would seem to be amply refuted by his own language in Articles 1 to 8, and some have in consequence regarded his accounts of these people as spurious. It is possible that Gennadius, without ever belonging to the semi-Pelagian party, may have partially come under the influence of the semi-Pelagian Cassian, who was himself a monk of Marseille. The Liber de Ecclesias Dogmatis of Gennadius was, as he himself says in the account of himself, sent by himself to Pope Galatius, and hence passed into the hands of Felix, his successor, successor who transmitted it to the council. If it were clear that Gennadius was a semi-Pelagian, the acts of the council would represent a curious phenomenon. Combination in one set of articles of the statements of two writers different and more or less directly antagonistic schools on the same subject without the church either then or since having discovered any discrepancy between the two. The quotations made from Gennadius only in the Acts of the Council comprise Articles 1 through 8, and the paragraphs which follow from Article 25. The rest, with the exception of Article 10, are all quoted from Prosper's Liber Sententiarum. But this work was a collection of extracts taken almost entirely from St. Augustine, there are only three of them quoted in the articles. And the two last, even of these, appear to be adaptations of St. Augustine's language. Three of the articles quoted from Prosper, 8, 19, and 21, have been already quoted by Gennadius. If we could trust our manuscripts, they would seem to have been taken verbally from that source for the text will be found to agree with Gennadius rather than Prosper. Thus, the articles of council fall under three main distinct heads. Articles 1 to 8, a condemnation of semi-Pelagian opinions taken consecutively from Gennadius. Articles 9 and 11 through 25, selection from Prosper's sentences quoted for the most part from St. Augustine, refuting various points in Pelagian's doctrine and arranged not on any doctrinal principle, but in order in which they occurred in prosper, but not consecutive. Three, a general summary of the Catholic doctrine as opposed to Pelagian 
and semi-Pelagian views taken consecutively from Gennadius. The order in the second of these divisions is purely accidental. Prosper himself makes the quotations in order in which they occurred in Saint the books of St. Augustine. To attempt, therefore, to discuss, discover any doctrinal method in their arrangement must be a useless waste of labor. Before studying in detail the language of these articles, it is important that the reader should thoroughly understand the main points at issue in the Pelagian controversy. <clears throat> he will then be able to see readily and clearly the bearing of smaller questions on those which may be considered fundamental. In order to do so, he should first endeavor to acquaint himself with the doctrines of either party considered as a whole, and then compare their respective views in detail, and so get to understand the several points on which they differed from each other. Following what we may call the historical order, we may divide the subject into four main divisions, the nature of man, sin, grace, good works. Of the four heads, the views of Pelagius may be described as follows. Human nature consisting of a mortal body and an immortal soul is acknowledged in both its parts to be the creation of God made for the highest purposes and potentially at least good. Man thus constituted had the alternative of good and evil offered to him with the free power of choosing either. This last is called in language, theological language, Liberium Arbitrium. Adam is a fact chose evil and so sin. Number two, sins must be regarded either as wrong actions done or good actions omitted. They have in no sense an existential existence and cannot therefore inherently belong to human nature so as to affect it as a disease. Adam's sin cannot therefore have produced any real effect on human nature. Men are still in a similar position to Adam and endowed with a nature precisely similar both in body and soul. They have the same free choice between good and evil, and if they sin, they are merely following the bad example set them by Adam. So, uh, it's got a footnote here. Some of these opinions were disclaimed by Pelagius, but in spite of his quibbles, they may be considered a fair representation of the views held at least by his party. Number three, in order to attain holiness and obtain everlasting life, man needs God's help and grace in many ways. It is by the good, God's goodness and power alone that man receives forgiveness for past sins. He has a nature endowed with an inherent power of doing good. But this nature thus endowed is itself the nature, the gift of God, because he made it. He has had from various times revelations from God, especially those known as the law given on Sinai and the gospel given by Christ. These teach men, men what they ought to do. The fact that he has the choice of obeying the law thus revealed is part of God's constitution. This free choice is therefore also a gift of God. For man may and indeed must obtain holiness by using all these gifts of God and by giving, doing such good works. Such works are the condition and ground of obtaining acceptance with God, who being just and holy, rewards us if we do good works pleasing to him and punishes us if we do contrary. Good works, therefore, merit God's grace, and in the end, eternal life. Those must insisted on are the entire renunciation of riches. 
There were two other doctrines closely connected and generally held with these. That is, human nature was in itself sinless. It was absurd to baptize infants who had committed no actual sin and therefore saved if they died. Six, that it was quite possible by the help of God's revelation without and his natural power within for man to live a perfectly sinless life, and several have actually done so. It should be observed that according to Pelagius's view, a very large number of small sins, such especially as arise from ignorance or forgetfulness, were regarded as an in inevitable and therefore not being subject to his free choice and as reality, no sins at all. Following the same method of arrangement, we may describe the corresponding tenets of St. Augustine almost in his own words as follows. One, both parts of human nature, body and soul, were made by God out of nothing. Both were originally immortal. Adam, therefore, had he not sinned, would have continued to have lived forever. Man was endowed not merely with bare liberium, liberium arbitrium, but with a good will, bona, voluntas, definite love of good, implied in the very idea of rectitude. But even in this condition of integrity, he needed God's grace to keep him from sin. Number two, sin, though not in itself, having an essential existence, was able to and did affect the nature of man, both in body and soul, which are substances, much as hunger or disease, which are equally without essential existence, weaken or impair the body. Man's whole nature was thus by Adam's transgression changed for the worse. The bonus, the bona voluntas was entirely lost and his choice was no longer properly free, but inclined to, to evil. This change affected the nature, not only of Adam himself, but of all those who are descended from him and so derived from him, not only their body, but also probably their soul. Three, the kinds of divine justice acknowledged by Pelagius are inadequate to produce a condition of justitia or holiness in man. Forgiveness alone is not enough. It can only have a remedial effect on the past. It cannot supply strength for the future. Nature is not enough, especially now that man has lost his original natural power. He wants, therefore, a supernatural power to restore nature and enable him to combat sin. Revelations from God in whatever form have of themselves no power to give man the inward moral or spiritual strength he needs. They are but preparatory to grace. The only moving power they can have is terror. But if they compel men to do right from fear of punishment, the motive is wrong, and the outwardly right actions are sins in the sight of God who sees the heart. The law shows man what is right and what is wrong, but does not give him the power of obedience. Practically, it frequently aggravates the evil. The rebellious spirit in man often sins all the more grievously, because he cannot bear the restraint the law imposes on him, just as the river dashes with greater violence over the barriers placed across it. Man's choice is no longer free. If it is free in any sense, it is only free to do evil, not to do good. In either case, it does not of itself constitute a moving power. Man, therefore, in order to reach the desired state and obtain eternal life, needs the special grace of God at all times, 
and no single good action can be done without the special help of God. Good works, therefore, are the works of God working with us and in us, and as such only can merit reward. It is the grace of God which first moves a man to seek for more grace from him and gives him the beginnings of faith. By the grace of God, he is reborn in baptism. By the grace of God, through the Holy Spirit, is infused charity by which he loves God and does that which pleases him. By the grace of God, he perseveres unto the end until he reaches perfection. Five, and the first of the two remaining doctrines of St. Augustine urges most emphatically and repeatedly that infants being born in sin require the regeneration of baptism and cannot be otherwise saved. He even argues that they are not only condemned, but justly condemned on the grounds that such sin as such deserves God's condemnation. In one passage, however, he considers that God may grant them a far milder condemnation than willful and deliberate sinners. On the last point, St. Augustine wavered considerably. First, on theological grounds, he was ready sometimes to admit the possibility of being without sin by the special power and grace of God. But he usually modified this by asserting that no man had actually lived here without sin and relegating the sinless state to man's condition hereafter. He is inclined, however, in one passage to make a single exception in the case of the Virgin Mary. In his treatise, De Dono Perseverantiae, he even goes so far as to speak of the doctrine of human sinlessness as one of the three cardinal errors of the Pelagians, but perhaps he intended to refer only to sinlessness deemed possible without divine grace. Later on, the main subject of the controversy changed, or rather, the controversy was more or less restricted to a single topic, namely the necessity of preceding grace, which was denied by the more moderate semi-Pelagian party. The quotations from Gennadius, Articles 1 to 8, are entirely concerned with this subject. They reiterate in a variety of ways the doctrine that man cannot help himself initiate the moral and spiritual work that results in regeneration, but that it depends upon God. The remaining articles treat of this and also the other parts of the wider subject, especially the need of cooperating grace by which alone man can persevere. If we accept the short passage bearing on predestination, the articles of the Council can certainly claim to represent the views of St. Augustine. As we have seen, the larger number of them, 11 and 15 to 25, are actually, though indirectly quoted almost verbally from his writings. The first eight are so like Augustine's teaching that there is hardly a phrase for which we cannot find an equivalent in his works. They show that Gennadius, their author, was a man who had carefully studied and caught the spirit of the champion of divine grace. Similarly, articles 9, 10, 12, and 14 exactly represent, though in somewhat different language, St. Augustine's teaching on the same topics. It has sometimes been maintained, as by Millman, that we have a, also a distinct departure from, or at least a modification of, the Augustinian theology in the assertion, as it is implied by the Western Church, of outward means of grace, such as baptism, which narrowed the sphere of God's action to the limits of the outward and visible church. So that while it expressly condemned semi-Pelagianism, 
it really introduced semi-Pelagian ideas. Whether this can or cannot be fairly considered a human limitation of divine power need not be considered here. It is only fair to recognize the fact that the limitation itself was repeatedly recognized by St. Augustine, who spoke sometimes in the most uncompromising manner of those who were without the reach of the outward means of grace. At the same time, it must be confessed that by the adoption of Gennadius's alteration of St. Augustine's language in Article 8, and of Gennadius' own language on the connection of preventing grace with baptism in Article 5, and in the concluding paragraph, the Council did undoubtedly give a distinct prominence to baptism as the outward means of electing grace. The Augustinian character of the Articles as a whole, and here can only be understood and appreciated by comparing the language of the articles with that of the great father himself, and the student is recommended to make careful study of the quotations given in full in the notes for this purpose from St. Augustine's works. And it looks like that is the end of the introduction. And then the canons, okay. Canons of the Second Council of Orange. I should have liked to have gotten to those. Well, please tell me there's an English translation. Yes, there is. Okay, let us call this to an end. Verse 1 of 330. Deck thyself, my soul. With gladness, leave the gloomy haunts of sadness. Come into the daylight splendor. There with joy thy praises render. Unto him whose grace unbounded hath this wondrous banquet founded. I o'er all the heavens he reigneth, yet to dwell with thee he deigneth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.